Mr. Georg Lohmann is a German philosopher and an emeritus of Magdeburg University. Professor Lohmann's main topics of research include local, global and applied justice, equality, different conceptions of human rights. He is an author of numerous articles and books, among which are Philosophy of Senses, Human Rights and Interdisciplinary Handbook, and Are Human Rights Universal? Mr. Georg Lohmann is with Georgia to participate in Presidential Collegium of State Arrangement. We remind our listeners that Presidential Collegium of State Arrangement is a project implemented by Georgian Institute of Public Affairs, GIPA, and funded by the Reserve Fund of uh, uh, President of Georgia. The project aims to organize multi-participatory public and academic discussions on topics such as legal state and democracy, religious pluralism and the role of religion in state formation, importance of public space in uh, construction of a constitutional state. During his visit in Georgia, Tbilisi, Professor Gozepat gave public lecture in Presidential Palace on the tension between national self-determination and human rights. And today he has kindly agreed to be, get, to be a guest on our show. Uh, Professor Lohmann, welcome and thank you for being our guest. Uh, Professor Lohmann, in the introduction I mentioned one of your book which is titled Are Human Rights Universal? So m maybe we can start from this uh, at the first glance simple but really a complicated question. Are human rights universal and in what sense are they? Of course they are universal, that's a claim. That they are individual rights for every human being. So first, the universality means that every human being uh, should be bearer of human rights. But in fact, if you look historically, uh, in the uh, first declaration of human rights and citizen rights in Virginia and in the independence declaration and also in the French Revolution, only white men, male men, are in fact the bearers of human rights. So women are not. Uh, uh, black people are not, colored people are not, and uh, innate people also. So there is a process of becoming a bearer of human rights, and so I think really understood and historically critical understood, uh, it is meant that human rights should be universalized. So there is a process that every human being, even those who are not citizens, even those who, have, who are stateless, that they should be respected and acknowledged as bearers of human rights. So one aspect is who is the bearer of human rights. But the other aspect of universality is, of course, who is the addressee of the duties that follows from having human rights. And here also we have an historical process of universalization and a change in process. That is a specific problem, maybe we can discuss it later. Professor, you mentioned a certain blind spot in the conception of human rights uh, in regards of the issue of stateless people and refugees. And this is a problem already mentioned by a notable uh, uh, German philosopher, Hannah Arendt, in the mid-20th century. So uh, on the one hand, the refugees are bearers of human rights, but on the other hand, there is no state that has a duty to protect us human rights and you might agree that this issue is gaining significance today because of the whole refugee crisis that is going on in Europe right now. So uh, what do you think is a solution to this uh, uh, cri cri crisis from a human rights perspective? I think uh, we have, let's say, an historically learning process here. So in the first traditional declarations, in the end of the 19th century, this was not really the problem. So they think only citizens who uh, are uh, acceptable bearers of human rights. Although in the text, literally, they claim more. They say every human being, but in fact only citizens are the bearers. So therefore, when it comes to a situation that somebody losing his citizenship or that he was not accepted as a regular citizen, he could not be accepted and acknowledged as a regular bearer of human rights. Therefore, Hannah Ahn says all the refugees during the Second World War came in a very bad position because then when they claim, hey, I have human rights, people say, sorry, you are not an acceptable bearer. You have no right to have rights because you are not a citizen. Therefore, she says, human rights are 
just rubbish. That's rhetorical illusion. And I think there is something wrong in the uh, 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 interpretation of then later on a critic of human rights. But she is right in picking up this problem. Mm -hmm. And I think just to solve this problem, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights after the Second World War tries to uh, declare and lose a look for solutions for this specific problem. Therefore, it said that every human being should be accepted as a subject before the law. So everybody has a specific, concrete, a specific human right to be a bearer of rights. This is a, so therefore means even if you are uh, a stateless people or uh, people without uh, papers, like a lot of the refugees nowadays. Every state who is a member of the international uh, treaties has to treat these people as if they are uh, bearers of rights. So they, they already have rights. Mm -hmm. And now is the question, why? That was, of course, a great question because state says, hey, in our tradition, because we are a sovereign state, we only accept those as bearers of rights we want to accept. So that means our citizen, sometimes citizen of other states, but only if it is in our interest, but not all people. So that's unbelievable for, in the tradition. And now the states agree that every human being should be uh, respected as a bearer of human rights. So that is a political decision. First, it is a political decision to do so. And it's binding only those states who take part in this treatise. But on the other hand, it is a legal form. And because it is a legal form now, there is, it becomes a, a tradition in the legal practice. And therefore, it is also binding to nowadays those states who are not members of the international treaties. And I think, certainly, what is also very important it is a morally justifiable claim that everybody should be accepted as a bearer of human rights. So therefore we have to distinguish the political decision, the decision that gave it a legal form in treaties and so on, or in constitution uh, in a specific state, and besides of this, certainly a moral justification why it is morally justified that everybody should be accepted as a bearer of human rights. And for this, uh, the new invention, one could say, the new interpretation of human dignity comes in. Because now it says it's a violation of our dignity not to be respected as a bearer of rights. Professor, you just mentioned the difference between uh, the earlier uh, declarations of human rights, like the Virginia Bill of Rights or uh, the French Declaration of Human uh, and Citizen Rights. Uh, and as far as I know, you conceptualize this difference in your uh, works as a difference between two different conceptions of human rights, the national conception of human rights and the international conception of human rights. So could you please elaborate for our listeners and viewers what's, what the principal differences between these two conceptions are and what implication does this have for the human rights concept. Yeah, see, uh, the historic first declarations of human rights were, I would say, uh, uh, national declaration. Mm -hmm. So the declaration of the human rights was a part of the founding act of a revolutionary new state, new democracy. Mm -hmm. After the Second World War, we had already states, sovereign states, they came together and decided first very unwillingly mm -hmm. uh, that there should be some kind of declaration of human rights. But then they say, okay, only a declaration, no legal international binding. So there is, of course, a very weak uh, application and effects of this declaration in the beginning. So the uh, declaration of, uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 was only, so to speak, a manifesto rights. The states say, oh, it would be nice if there will be human rights, but we are not legally binding by international law by this. And then uh, I think two uh, elements of the international law came into this. First, uh, traditionally the international law 
is made by the treaties of sovereign states and only in so far as they accept and agree in a treaty to do this and this and that follows this and this obligation. So if a state says what very often happens, okay, we agree or ratify this uh, convenient, uh, this covenant, but we with uh, certain acceptance. So we don't do this and this. For instance, I'll give you an example. There's a very funny, uh, very interesting uh, 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 international treaty uh, to protect children. I would say, okay, fine, everybody is for the protection of children, so there should be a human rights declaration to for protection of children. And then, in the beginning, Switzerland, England says, okay, we agree to this treaty, but we allow uh, corporal punishment. So, in the treaty, it said there is not allowed to punish uh, children corporal and with uh, body uh, uh, punishment and, that, and then say, no, no, that's a good tradition in Switzerland and in England, so we accept. Mm -hmm. And then it takes 10 years uh, after they uh, uh, re-criticizing and re get a revision and then, okay, we accept also that it's not allowed to uh, make corporal punishment of children. So, you see, uh, human rights, the, and I call this an international conception of human rights. It is only binding in so far as it fits to the specific interests of sovereign states. And it is an open historical process what uh, will be done here in this end. And the other point is, of course, human rights in this con uh, uh, conception, international conception, are given to the people, but not by the people themselves. Uh -huh. So you are a bearer of human rights, uh, but you are not the author of your rights. And not the source. And not the source. And this, of course, is a violation, I would say, of the implicit democratic claim of human rights. Because when human rights are equal, it could not be that some uh, citizens mm -hmm. are equal with others, but they have also the capacity and the possibility to give other people rights. So then we have an unequal distribution of the right to create rights. So if it is true that human rights are universal and equal, and everybody should have the same kinds of rights, it means that everybody should be accepted as the bearer and the co-author of his rights or her rights. So therefore, I think this is one point. So there is, a let's say, a democratic manco uh, in this international conception, and therefore I would say there is a claim, a normative claim, mm -hmm. to develop uh, a third conception of human rights, which I called transnational conception. Professor, as you have just mentioned in your articles, you also discuss uh, the recent of development of a transnational conception of human rights, whereby actors other than states, uh, uh, regional uh, organizations, uh, NGOs, even individuals interested in protection of human rights play a uh, uh, play more and uh, more and more significant role in protection of human rights. Are these de development significance? Can we really speak about a new conception of human rights in a strong sense? And also, could you please elaborate what are the main characteristics of this uh, conception? I think there are, let's say, two main reasons. First, mm -hmm. this normative one I already mentioned because if human rights are equal rights, then it means that every human being should be respected as a bearer and the co-author of his rights. And that means he has to give themselves, human beings have to give themselves the rights they have. So that means human rights are not, mm -hmm. like in the national conception of human rights, given by nature, by natural law. And they are also not given by a moral justification. So it is not so that if you have a moral justification of a specific human right, then there is already this kind of human right. Mm -hmm. So it is not so that if you have a mor uh, moral justification, then politics is only a mean to give it a legal form. Mm -hmm. And I criticize this understanding moral fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. You see? So that is wrong. So what we need now is a transnational, because they are universal, uh, uh, 
legal process, legal uh, process of giving and creating human rights and discussing. Mm -hmm. In fact, of course, there is no such a global uh, community. But if you look to the European uh, community, mm -hmm. you see there you have, let's say, steps in this direction that we have mm -hmm. a kind of European Parliament, mm -hmm. we have a kind of European transnational discussion publicly mm -hmm. uh, about uh, the relevance and the creation of new human rights, let's say, for instance, the right or informational self-determination uh, mm -hmm or the human right to water, so that's some kinds of new rights. And then, of course, there should be this kind of process of transcending the national borders. And therefore, so this is one. And the other point is, of course, also important. Traditionally, until now, I would say the best legal organization to protect human rights are the national legal system, with a, a, a constitutional court and things like that. But we have a lot of problems where national sovereignty and national mm -hmm. acts don't reach to this. So let's say the control of international business companies. Mm -hmm. They use the weakness of a lot of national legal systems mm -hmm. uh, and they uh, always moving and, and uh, hiding their, their, their specific interests and, and activities. So they are not really controllable uh, by national legal systems. Therefore, we need an international legal system. But the international legal system, if you look like in the national treaties, is very, very weak. So normally, you only have obligations to inform mm -hmm. uh, that you try, that the state tries as far as it's possible, very often is said, uh, to protect and to fulfill the duties that follow out of the human rights, especially if you look to the international treaty of the economic, uh, cultural and social rights. So therefore, to strengthen the international control and protection of human rights, we need a better international uh, uh, organization. And then, of course, we have a lot of uh, different proposals uh, constitutionalization of the international law, like Habermas has said, others speak of globalization, of global democracy, and things like that. And of course, as we know, uh, we are doing step by step, and in the moment, I would say, we have more a process of re-rationalization, re re-nationalization, and not of internationalization of uh, the international politics. Uh, Mr. Lohmann, thank you for uh, being our guest. It was a pleasure. Uh, this was an interview with, with Mr. Georg Lohmann, an emeritus of Magdeburg University.